Thank you for joining us today, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be joined by Stein Ringen, uh, who is a social scientist, but he has done a slight detour in his work with this book that we're talking about today, The Story of Scandinavia. Um, and I wondered, Stein, if you could start off by telling us what prompted you? Why did you feel the story of Scandinavia needed to be told? Well, it, it is such a fantastic story because the Scandinavians started from scratch, from nothing, latecomers in Europe, barbarians, um, wild tribes, the last to start to form nations, the last to become Christian. They started from really nothing. And today, it's pretty much the most sophisticated and advanced place anywhere in the world. So how did that happen, that these latecomers in a relatively short time, came to where they are today. So that's really what inspired me to try to tell this story. Now, there's a personal element to this book as well, isn't there? Because you're writing as someone who has Scandinavian heritage. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Well, about I, I am Norwegian, although I've lived in this country now for many, many years. And this was, a way, in a way, a return to my origins. Mm. And I am... You know, I am one of Europe's many migrants, and we are rootless and confused. And I think we, we, all of us who are migrants, we have in common that at some time we want to think about where we come from. And it's personal in that way, I think. It was a, a kind of a personal journey to understand something about my own origins and journey. Mm. Uh, and there is there's a good deal of personal stuff in it, more, maybe more than there should be, but there is some personal stuff in this book. Well, I, I, I really enjoyed the personal element because you draw on your, your great uncle was a farmer, I think. Am I right in that? Well, and you spent some time on his farm. Oh, yes. No, I, there's a lot on my, my, my uncle. And, and I was a young farmhand on his farm. <laughs> and he taught me a lot, my uncle. And, and we also visit my great-grandfather and his descendants. Um, so um, uh, uh, the, it is that. It, the, there's a good deal of that. Um, and, um, you know, part of this fantastic story I mentioned is that most of it happened in the 20th century, very late. Mm. You know, Scandinavia, in the beginning of the 20th century, Scandinavia was the most, the most underdeveloped part of Europe. Poor, disorganized, characterized by state failure, it was absolutely miserable. <laughs> and then in a very short time, it became quite sophisticated and advanced. And um, my own family story is entangled in that. Mm -hmm. That's, so there are some elements from that story which I think cast some light on that movement. Now, one of the challenges with telling a story is deciding where it starts. And you decided to start 1,200 years ago. Why that point? Why was that the point to start this story? Well, the book starts like this. <laughs> Gudfred died in the year 810. He was murdered. <laughs> and then we go from there. Gudfred was the first Scandinavian king of any note. Uh, and he was killed. We'd known almost nothing about him. Because this, at this time, the Scandinavians were not writing people. They didn't have writing, so we have no documents. So what little we know about him is something that is told about him in the Frankish sources around uh, Charles the Great, Charlemagne. And Gudfred thought, well, I'm king of Denmark, so I can take on Charlemagne. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> and they probably killed him because he was a troublemaker and it was much easier to kill this little king than to have to engage in a war up there in the north. So, um, so that's, that's where it starts. And then I follow all these, uh, lots of kings in this book. Lots of kings. And there are two queens. Two queens, although they weren't I mean, allowed three. to be called queens well, at the time, were they? Well, is, some of them were. This is so, but... Yeah. But Women couldn't formally be the ruler. At least not the first one. She couldn't be queen. The yeah. second one, these two queens were Queen Margrethe 
in the 14th century. Uh, and the second one was Queen Christina in the 17th century. They are fantastic stories. Most of the kings are completely indifferent, incompetent, uh, uh, thinking too highly of themselves, miserable managers, uh, not much to speak of. But these two queens, they were great personalities. And I, I have been asked um, elsewhere if there's someone in this story that I'd really like to meet. And I'd like to meet these two queens because they, they, were, they were great personalities and they had great ideas. And I would have liked to talk to them about what their ideas were. Well, you say that Margreta was almost the first person to have the ambition to unite Scandinavia in some sense. Well, she created a union of the three Scandinavian countries, the, the Kalmar Union. And for a while, the three countries were united under one crown, hers. Yes. <laughs> because that's important as well. I think we should define our terms. So Scandinavia, we're talking about the three countries here, aren't we? That's right. So we're talking about Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. People often or sometimes confuse uh, what Scandinavia might mean and think of Iceland as well and Finland, but those are Nordic yeah. countries, aren't yeah. they, technically? Uh, that confusion is fine. It's just uh, it would have been too difficult for me to include all of the countries. So it <laughs> couldn't be done. Uh, so I, I couldn't manage that. Um, and I mean, we, Magretta's achievement is particularly impressive when you consider, because women don't figure in much of the formal history, do they? And you say, actually, the strategy for a woman who wanted to matter was to be of good family and to marry well, preferably both, and then to be of strong will. Exactly. Um, it's quite a tall, tall order. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they, were, they were quite... They, they weren't invisible in any way. But most of them were confined to intriguing. You know, they couldn't really have office. But they were great intriguers, and they would intrigue on behalf of their own sons, really. I mean, those who were in the royal sort of... Um, and they all wanted their own sons to do well. So they would... Uh, you know, Margareta had the advantage of having a son, so she could make him king, and then she could rule. But she also had a sister who had a son, and she... She pushed that sister aside. She outmaneuvered that other sister who also had a son and made her son the king. He then obliged and died very soon so she could really take mm. over. Mm. Now, a lot of people, when they think about Scandinavian history, will think about Vikings. Um, and a lot of Scandinavia, a lot of histories that you discuss in the book have been quite... Um, full of praise or full of, of kind of a bullion kind of pride in the Viking legacy. You're rather less uh, celebratory about it. Uh, why is that? Um, well, there's, there's a, a long tradition in Scandinavian history writing, not only Scandinavian, but in Scandinavian history writing, to write sort of heroic history. Mm. To write today in a way that glorifies the fatherland and so on. And part of that, uh, became to elevate the Vikings to something really special, that they were representatives of a special civilization. And I don't think that's true very much. They were, they were, they were considered in Europe to be barbarians, and I think they were. They were murderous, violent, and they had an exceptional and these were violent times, so everyone was violent, but they were better in being violent than others. And they really out the rest <laughs> of the lot. And they, <laughs> so they were, they were, they were hard going. They were Why hard was going. that? Why were they so? Is because, ah, because there I, because I, I've done something that, that no one else has done about the Viking Age. I've counted them. I said, how many were they? Because I'm a social scientist, you know, historians don't count. They don't like numbers, but I'm a social scientist, so I count. And I found out that there were very few. Um, and they had a lot of things to do. They had different places to go uh, and terrorize. They needed to trade. There was a lot. So they were very few. And, and if they were going to be successful, they had no other way of being successful than being better than others in being violent. Uh, and one, um, one way we see that is that 
in the beginning of the Viking, first part of the Viking age, before they were Christian, when they were still pagans, uh, they were indifferent to churches and monasteries, and churches and monasteries in Europe were rich places. And they had sanctuary churches and monasteries. Most European kings and chiefs respected churches and monasteries because they were Christian. It's not that they weren't violent, but, but they, they had a respect for churches and monasteries. So churches and monasteries were, before the Vikings arrived, left in peace. They accumulated wealth, and they were not very well protected. Ideal for the Vikings, and the beginning of their activity, what they attacked was churches and monasteries and took their valuables. Oh, you write particularly grippingly about Lindisfarne, uh, the, the atrocity, yeah. which I hadn't appreciated really until I read your account. Well, Lindisfarne, um, I mean, some of you will have been to, to Lindisfarne. You know, it's, it's uh, up there towards uh, the Scottish border on the English coast, and in what was about 780, or I forget exact year, a band of Vikings attacked Lindisfarne. This was at the very beginning of the Viking Age. And they came out of nowhere, total surprise. They took the monastery. They made way with all the valuables, the silver, all of that. They killed most of the monks. They took young men into slavery. And they left the place destroyed. Destroyed. And it was an absolutely terrible act of violence and barbarity. And it was noticed in that way through Europe. And European commentators said, this is a warning of what is to come. I don't think it really was a warning. They, did, they just happened to come across this monastery, I think. But it was a warning of things to come. And from then on, they plundered churches and monasteries and made way with their wealth from the German lands through down to France, Spain, England, Ireland, and elsewhere. And wherever they went, they plundered the churches and the monasteries. Mm. And they ruled in the, U in the UK, in England, for some time. I mean, they ruled York for 100 years or so yeah. at one point, didn't they? Uh, Dana, La Dana Law. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about that? Because I think many <laughs> people may not appreciate quite how, how much the Vikings had a part to play in British history. <clears throat> well, the Vikings... Um, or Norsemen had control of England north of the Thames, really, for about a hundred years, mm. more or less. It wasn't really a kingdom. There was no king of all this area, but there were there, were, there was a king of of York, Jorvik, they called it. Um, and what that meant was really that it was the Norsemen who collected taxes from these areas, and not English kings. Um, but they held that territory for about a hundred years. Um, and they were near to being able to take southern England also, where, um, however, the, the, the kings of Wessex, Alfred of Wessex in particular, held the Vikings off, and he and his descendants were gradually able to kick them, pull them out. So. The, the Danes, these were the Danes, really. They held much of England for about 100 years. They were pushed out, but then they came back for a second time, and King Knut, K. Knut, became king of all of England. Hmm. He, um, that was as a result of warfare. He, he prevailed in warfare. He got the Archbishop of Canterbury to crown him as king of England. And the first thing he did was he collected a massive tax from the English. Uh, 80,000 pounds of silver, I think, or something like that. Much of, what, much of what went into paying off the other Viking chiefs who had helped him in this warfare. And then he ruled as king of England for about 30 years until that fell apart. 
and that was the end of the Danes in England. But they had, there were two periods, mm. the Dane law and then the period of Knut the Great. And, and it's thought that uh, the rhyme London Bridge is falling down may have some Viking connection. Yeah, there is a Viking like, connection yeah. there because the, the thing about these Norse Vikings is that they, they also fought each other. Not only they. Um, and at this time, uh, the Danes were in control of London. Mm. And English lords wanted to change the Danes away. And they allied with uh, Norwegian Vikings. So the Norwegians fought the Danes. <laughs> and they sailed up to London with a fleet. And London was defended from London Bridge. That was the only bridge across the Thames at the time. And the, the uh, Danish soldiers amassed on the bridge to prevent the Norwegians and the English from getting through. And the Norwegian chief, Olaf Haraldsson, the later Saint Olaf, so the story goes, found a way of undermining London Bridge so that it fell in on itself by the weight of all the soldiers <laughs> that were standing on it and fell down. And that's supposed to be the origins of the children's rhyme, London Bridge is falling down. <laughs> True or not, I don't know, but that is, there's no other uh, evidence of London Bridge ever having fallen down. So maybe it's true. Very interesting. Um, now, you mentioned slavery, and slavery was a huge part of the Viking operation, wasn't it? Um, and in fact, shockingly, there were accounts of, of slaves, British slaves, being sold in mainland Europe, having been captured by Vikings. Can you tell us a bit more about, about slavery and how it played out in this, in this context? Well, the... The, the home economies were slave economies, so that uh, agricultural work was mainly done by slaves. And these slaves could be neighbors. You know, they could be from Sweden or from England or from Germany, captured during raids. Uh, and the other presence was in slave trade. They were fabulous slave traders. So wherever they went, down the Russian rivers, for example, they would capture people and take them down and sell them in slave markets elsewhere. So they were big slave traders. Had no trouble with slavery or slave trade. And they were traders, and one of the most important trades was a trade in people, in slavery. Um, that all came to an end around 1200 or so. But later, when the transatlantic slave trade, uh, you know, plantation economy in the Americas and transatlantic slave trade became important business, the Scandinavians were there again hmm. and resumed with others slave trading. No, they had no problem with that. And they were, the Danes in particular, they were prolific slave traders then again. A, a common theme that you return to over the course of the history is the idea that there's been overreaching. That's been a, a common problem in the Scandinavian history of uh, overambition, uh, reaching too far and, and coming a cropper as a result. Um, and you talk a, a little bit about uh, colonial ambitions. Um, and Scandinavia has not been a great colonial power, has it? But it has... There are a few things that it's done. Mm. Greenland, for example, an interesting example uh, that to this day has a connection to Den Denmark. It's, it's formally, it's in its uh, own rule, but it's still a Danish territory, yeah. I believe. No, they, were, they, weren't, they weren't bad at being colonial. Um, I mean, the Swedes had colonies uh, in, um, on the continent. Uh, you know, the, what are now the Baltic states were long Swedish colonies. Um, uh, the Norwegians had colonies in um, Shetland, the Orkneys, um, um, uh, the Hebrides, Iceland and Greenland. Um, and Denmark had colonies in the Caribbean. They had, uh, you know, the, the islands that are today the American Virgin Islands were Danish 
plantation colonies. Um, now, Greenland is <laughs> special because you may remember that Donald Trump, when he was president, he wanted to buy Greenland. <laughs> he said to the Danes, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it of you. And the Danes and the Scandinavians and the Greenlanders thought this was, this was very strange. This was, <laughs> this was, uh, but it was, it was not the first time. Um, after the Second World War, President Truman wanted to buy Greenland. Yes, I hadn't realized that. Uh, so that came to nothing, and Trump's effort came to nothing, and the, and the Danes said, you know, that man must be, uh, must be uh, off his, off, uh, has lost his good senses. But, you know, it doesn't make much sense that little Denmark on the European continent owns Denmark, owns Greenland. Greenland is the world's biggest island, except for Australia. Snug up against North America. And why on earth should Denmark own <laughs> that island? So, so it wasn't maybe as mad as it may seem. Because it was Eric who, who conquered, or it was one of the first yeah. uh, to, to arrive in Greenland. Yeah. And you say he, in a propaganda move, he called it Greenland. He Why called was it. that? What, what? Well, he, this is Eric the Red. He mm. was in Iceland and he was expelled from Iceland for murder. And he had to, he, he was, uh, uh, dis expelled from the country for three years. So we sailed off to, to what became Greenland and explored that and came back three years later and wanted to create a settlement in Greenland. And, and in order to get, uh, you know, some Icelanders to go with him, he said, he called it Greenland. <laughs> this is very fertile. <laughs> so they did go and settle Greenland. And that became the Norse settlement in Greenland and Greenland then became first Icelandic, then it became Norwegian when Norway took over Iceland, and then it became Danish when Denmark took over Norway. And it's still Danish, it's mm. still Danish, although it now has pretty much autonomy, but not totally. Mm. When the Chinese wanted to buy a disused airfield in Greenland, wow. The Greenland authorities said, that's okay, because, you know, this is, this is good money. But the Danish government said, no, you, we're not having that. Hmm. So they're not completely autonomous, but they're pretty autonomous. Th there was a less successful colonial project in the US, wasn't there? An American, a, a, a short-lived Scandinavian-American community colony. There, there was, a, there was a, an American colony in North America hmm. called New Sweden. <laughs> which is in Delaware. Uh, and in, um, in um, uh, what's the name of the capital of Delaware? Oh. Uh, uh, Wilmington, uh -huh. which is where President Biden is from. Um, there was uh, a Swedish colony. And the oldest stone church in North America is built by the Swedish. Oh. The first Lutheran church in North America. And when um, uh, President Biden was able to declare that he had won the election when he became president, he made that announcement uh, at a place on the River Christina that runs through Wilmington in Delaware, named after Queen Christina, one of these yes. two queens that I mentioned previously. So there was a little Danish a little Swedish colony there for a while, but that petered out, it, it came to an end, but it was New Sweden for a while. Mm. There's something that comes through very strongly in your book is how prevalent war is in this history, not just in Scandinavian history, in all of European history, and actually how unusual the period of peace that we have lived through for much, well, the latter half of the 20th century is, um, and as you say, how fragile it, it appears now. Um, I, I was wondering how, um, as you said, you know, your project when you started this book was to answer the question, how did it get from such a violent society to being so seen as so progressive now with this backdrop of war? 
I know the whole book is answering this question and you can't possibly answer it in, you know, two minutes, but can you, can you give us some pointers about what your conclusions on that, how, how that extraordinary change came about? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's too difficult. But <laughs> I can't, and I should, but I can't really, but... But I can say, you know, you mentioned overreach. All these kings, they were overreaching all the time. All the wars they engaged in, most of them were unsuccessful. They wanted more than they could have. And um, only with the, with, when we came into the Enlightenment period, uh, you know, period after the Napoleonic Wars, there were some semi-Napoleonic wars also up in Scandinavia, but let's put after that. I think, I think it's reasonable to say that the Scandinavians then, by then, had learned through about a thousand years of failure that they mustn't overreach mm. and that they came to understand each other. The kings came to understand their kingdoms as modest, small kingdoms that couldn't operate on a big scale on the European stage. So um, I think there was some... <laughs> there is Sicily. There's a Sicilian Sicil connection oh, also. Oh, there you we know? go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they learned the hard way that they were small countries that couldn't aspire to be big powers. And that enabled them, I think, to really start to look at themselves and to try to, with many other influences, to try to understand themselves in a realistic manner. Mm. Now, you, uh, for someone who's thinking of visiting and, and keen to see something of the history of Scandinavia, if you had to pick out uh, a key site or two that would be worth, that would capture some of the essence of this story, where, where would you direct people to, to visit? No, I think... Um, I mean, the further north you get, the more dramatic it is. It is, and, and, but that is, that's, I mean, the history is dramatic, but also the nature is so dramatic. So the, the very north is really interesting to see. You get up, in the north of Norway, you get up to the ultimate edge of Europe. And there are little communities that sit, scratch, a presence on, in, in the landscape there in an area where human habitation should not be possible. And that thrive, they are doing well. So that is, that is a very interesting, um, interesting experience, I think. Um, uh, so I think um, <laughs> from a travel we are in a travel we place, a from travel a travel plan. perspective. Yes. <laughs> I would say that the, the north, and wherever you go, it's, it's nature. Nature is fantastic and dramatic. So that is, that is, um, that that, is something that is, to see. That is something that comes across very strongly, is the, the role that geography has to play in this history, yeah. because Norway had its own particular challenges because of its, its geography. Uh, agriculture was that much more difficult there as compared to, say, Denmark. Yeah. Um, and it becomes a, comes across really clearly, I think. In, it in does, the, that, yeah. And, yeah. And Sweden, you know, is, is virtually a landlocked area. They, for them, the, the Baltic is their sea. And in the Viking Age, the Swedes went eastwards into Russia, mm. conquered much of the areas around the big Russian rivers, whereas the Norwegians went to the west, to England and to, to Scotland and to and to Ireland and beyond. So the geography has directed things until recently. And, you know, when, when Norway was attacked and taken over by Nazi Germany in the Second World War, what Germany wanted was the Norwegian coast, you know, which covers the Atlantic and which is shot through by fjords, which are ideal hiding places for naval 
ships and submarines, and which the Germans used very effectively as launching places and hiding places for their navy during the Second World War. The, um, you talk about music in your book. You're, you're actually very... Uh, you, you don't uh, waste a lot of praise on many of the Scandinavian arts, certainly the, the ancient forms. Um, you're quite kind of direct in, in not finding the ancient literature particularly impressive in many ways. Um, but music, you do... You do uh, you are very enthusiastic about, and you say that, for example, the Swedish choral tradition is, is very strong today. If someone wanted to hear some of this music, where's a good place to go? Where, where would you recommend? Yes, I, there's one thing I should have been able to say more about, and that is the traditional folk music, mm. which goes far back. And I haven't, I, I'm something about it, but I haven't really been able to bring the folk music tradition into this story. Uh, for example, there is a, a, a particular kind of Norwegian fiddle called the Harding fiddle, which has eight strings. It's a Norwegian invention. It's a very unique kind of fiddle and has a very unique sound. And it isn't mentioned here. It should be. But so there's much there I, I, couldn't, I couldn't cover. But today, the the, the Scandinavian countries are vividly musical, in, in particular Sweden. Mm. And the, the musical tradition in Sweden is marvelous. And there are supposedly more people singing in choirs in Sweden than in any other population in the world. Almost, you know, lots and lots of people sing in choirs on all levels of, of proficiency. And uh, the Swedish song tradition is very strong. It really starts with a man called uh, Bellman in the late 18th century, in the liberal period in Sweden. And he, he was a poet and a songwriter. And he wrote songs which the Swedes sing all the time today. Everyone knows his songs by heart. And his theme was... Uh, the tavern, drink, women, and fun. <laughs> and they are songs of great wisdom, but also very entertaining. He follows a few people, and they are either in the tavern drinking, or they are in the gutter outside, or, uh, or, um, or however. Um, and, and, and it's songs that, that, these are songs that are, enormously alive today and that are sung around dinner tables as a matter of routine. Mm. People sing all the time. Mm. So you've talked about this, this troubled history. We've had a, a brief period of peace and stability in the 20th century. Things are now looking more uncertain again. Uh, and climate change may play a role in that with the, the Arctic receding, uh, the ice receding. What do you think the future may hold for Scandinavia? Um, well, it's, it's hard as it is generally. Um, the, the Scandinavians are engaged in trying to manage climate change like everyone else, more or less successfully. It's difficult in particular for the Norwegians. <laughs> Because the Norwegians have been very lucky. A few years ago, they discovered all this oil and gas under the North Sea. And they have been pumping it up and making themselves super rich. But in the process, the economy has become dependent on petroleum. And the Norwegians now have to reinvent their economy. And it's a pretty difficult process. But they, they're engaging in that. Um, so... Um, I think the, the Scandinavians are probably better situated than most people to manage the most countries to manage these challenges because they are now very well governed countries um, and they have a, a cultural advantage I think 
now in that, at least I say so, I may be wrong, but I say so, that they have, they have a cultural advantage in trust. You know, these are very peaceful in communities now, and by and large, people are able to trust each other and their economic and political institutions, and to trust that their systems of government are doing reasonably well. So they have a capital of trust. Being, living in England, it's a real contrast. Mm. Uh, and you know, if you look to America, it's a, it's a mega contrast. Mm. So there is this capital of trust, mm -hmm. which probably, at least I speculate, so in the very end, that, that, it, that will serve them should serve them pretty well. Mm. We're, we're going to open up to some audience questions now. Um, if anyone has a question, we have a roving microphone ready to come and, and capture that question. Would anyone like to ask Stein anything? Yes, there's a gentleman here. Hello there. Um, could you tell us something about the different languages? Because to somebody who doesn't speak uh, any of the Scandinavian languages, the Norwegian, Swedish and Danish sound remarkably similar. Um, so a um, couple of questions. First of all, can a Norwegian understand anything that a Swede or a Danish is saying and vice versa? And secondly, um, why, by chance, has there not been a kind of uh, uh, combined Scandinavian language? How come that the three languages have appear to remain distinct? Mm -hmm. They are dialects of the same language. So they're all Germanic languages and they're dialects. And they understand each other reasonably well. Not perfectly but reasonably well. Um, and uh, the second, answer, se second question, why there hasn't emerged one uh, Scandinavian language, I can't really answer. The mystery is really that Danish has survived, because Denmark is attached to Germany. And in periods, the Danish language was about to die and be um, pushed aside by German. But it has survived. Um, now today, the languages are becoming more similar to each other by the influence of English. So English is now has a very strong presence in all the Scandinavian languages. And I'll give you, I'll give, just give you an example because I have just been translating this book myself into Norwegian, <laughs> where I've been using Norwegian spell check. And I'll give you one example. The term hanger-on, a hanger-on, is accepted as a good Norwegian term in the Norwegian spell check program. Wow. Gosh. So <laughs> English is getting a very strong presence in all those languages. So if they are approaching each other, it is through the influence of English. Hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? I mean, it's a, it's a, the language question is very interesting because language is such a powerful influence in these countries. And it's very, very political. Today, to this day, uh, there are two Norwegian languages, strangely enough. Uh, and within those languages, words have different forms. And whether you choose one or the other form of simple words, like forwards or house or son tells you if you are on the political right or the political left. Mm. Now, this is so, so. There's so. a perception, isn't there, that um, Scandinavians speak very good English. Um, and that, that proves to be true in many cases. But are there any parts of Scandinavia where an English speaker would, st would struggle to be understood? I don't think so, okay. no. Be, you, you, if, if, you, if you wanted to travel to Scandinavia, you don't have to worry about not getting along in English. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, there's a question here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then one, one further back. 
Can I press that? Oh. You said earlier that um, uh, Scandinavia hadn't done anything fantastically impressive politically for a very long time. What's changed? What's, what's made Scandinavia such a success now? I think you intimated that it, it's doing really well politically and economically. What, what's their secret? <sighs> well, I have, I have to do the, the thinking trick and say that's a very good question. <laughs> Um, let me say, I mean, some Scandinavians would say that it's social democracy. That the, the brand of social democratic influence has really been a strong force in 20th century transitions in Scandinavia. And I think that's right, but I don't think it's in any way the full answer. Another part of the answer is that, that they have been blessed by having good governments, good, honest governance. So again, that gives rise to this human capital of cultural capital of trust. That there is a sort of social cohesion, so collaboration is pretty easy. So maybe that is another part of the answer. Um, and then in the 20th century, very quickly, they became quite affluent. So they, they do have a lot of money to work with. Not just the Norwegians with their petroleum, but all of them. They're, they became pretty rich. And they were able to manage that transition from poverty to affluence pretty well, to share pretty well. So these are some elements of the of of comments, at least, to your, your difficult question. I think we have time for one last question. Was there one further back? Um, up. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. You talked about social... Sorry, I've got to stand up because I'm so short. Um, you talked about social de uh, democracy in Scandinavia. Um, and I wonder what, uh, what influence... Um, the lower level, if, if lower is the right word, of um, the um, ethnic and cultural population has had on that social democracy. I know you compared Scandinavia to the, the UK, and I know you're in London and you were saying how different uh, the, the, the two places were. And I just wondered what the influence of increased... Um, uh, cultural and um, ethnic populations have on that social democracy uh, where there can be more elevated uh, differences and, um, and challenges around that. Thank you. Yeah, now we, we're, uh, again, that's of course a very good question and a very difficult question and we're getting a little bit into my own field, since I'm a political scientist, I should be able to answer that. And, and there are many uh, things to be said on that question, but let me just say one thing, that the trade union organization in Scandinavia took a very particular shape. The trade unions became very strong and very centralized in the way they were run. So there was one trade union movement. It wasn't like in Britain, where you have all scattered trade unions all over the place. And the trade unions became so popular, uh, so powerful, that they could afford to work collaboratively. They had real influence. They weren't confined to working through strikes and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, when, when, when they became powerful, that way of working was superfluous. And they were able to make themselves a social partner in a very strong way. And I think that trade union organization was, has been a very important part of the story and a part of the answer to your, to your, uh, uh, to your big questions. So, 
Fantastic. Well, I hate to cut you short there, Stein, but I'm afraid we are coming to the end of the session. Stein will be signing books right next door, and I would really recommend uh, that you get hold of a copy um, because it's a fantastic read. So much information that I think well, was new to me and just really accessible and enjoyable reading and, and a really rich book. So um, I, I heartily recommend it to you. But for now, I just ask you to join me in thanking Stein Ringen.